ਜੇ ਕੋਈ ਮੈਥੋਂ ਪੁੱਛੇ ਕਿ ਵਿਦਿਅਕ ਸੰਸਥਾਵਾਂ ਦੇ ਕੀ ਮਾਇਨੇ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਜੇ ਮੈਥੋਂ ਕੋਈ ਪੁੱਛੇ ਕਿ ਵਿਦਿਅਕ ਸੰਸਥਾਵਾਂ ਦੇ ਕੀ ਮਾਇਨੇ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਮੈਂ ਕਹਾਂਗਾ ਫੈਕਟਰੀਆਂ ਹੁੰਦੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਜਾਂ ਕਾਰਖਾਨੇ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਇਹ ਕਾਰਖਾਨਿਆਂ 'ਚ ਨੁਕਸ ਹੈ ਜਾਂ ਮਜ਼ਦੂਰਾਂ ਦੀ ਅਣਗਹਿਲੀ ਕਿ ਪੁਰਜੇ ਜਦ ਮੰਡੀ 'ਚ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਸਿਰਫ 5% ਹੀ ਆਪਣੀ ਕੀਮਤ ਪਵਾਉਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਬਾਕੀ ਅਨਫਿਟ ਹੋ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਹਾਂਜੀ ਦੋਸਤੋ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਸ਼ਾਇਰ ਮਿੰਦਰਪਾਲ ਪੱਠਲ ਜੀ ਦੀ ਕਵਿਤਾ ਪੁਰਜੇ ਦੀਆਂ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਸਤਰਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਪਿਆਰ ਭਰੀ ਸਤਿ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਅਕਾਲ ਅਦਾਬ ਨਮਸਤੇ ਗੁੱਡ ਈਵਨਿੰਗ ਸਲਾਮ ਮੈਂ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਲਖਵੀਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਦਸ਼ਮੇਸ਼ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਕਾਲਜ ਮੁਕਤਸਰ ਪਰਿਵਾਰ ਦੇ ਇਸ ਆਨਲਾਈਨ ਵੇੜੇ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਇਸਤਕਬਾਲ ਕਰਦਾ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਸਵਾਗਤ ਦੋਸਤੋ ਮੈਂ ਗੁਜ਼ਾਰਿਸ਼ ਕਰਾਂਗਾ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਦੋਸਤ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਫੇਸਬੁੱਕ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ YouTube ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਲਾਈਵ ਜੁੜੇ ਹੋਏ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਬੇਨਤੀ ਕਰਾਂਗਾ ਕਿ ਉਹ ਦੋਸਤ ਵੱਧ ਤੋਂ ਵੱਧ ਆਪਣੇ ਬਾਕੀ ਦੋਸਤਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਆਪਣੇ ਸਹਿਕਰਮੀਆਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਆਪਣੇ ਵਿਦਿਆਰਥੀਆਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਇਸ ਮਹੱਤਵਪੂਰਨ ਲੈਕਚਰ ਨੂੰ ਸਾਂਝਾ ਕਰ ਦੇਣ ਤਾਂ ਕਿ ਸਾਡੇ ਬਾਕੀ ਦੋਸਤ ਆ ਜਾਣ ਤੇ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਇਸ ਇੰਪੋਰਟੈਂਟ ਲੈਕਚਰ ਨੂੰ ਸ਼ੁਰੂ ਕਰ ਸਕੀਏ ਤੋਂ ਸੋ ਦੋਸਤਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਗੁਜ਼ਾਰਿਸ਼ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਐਜੂਕੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਸੰਬੰਧਿਤ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਅੱਜ ਦਾ ਲੈਕਚਰ ਹੈ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਵੱਧ ਤੋਂ ਵੱਧ ਬਾਕੀ ਦੋਸਤਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਂਝਾ ਕਰ ਦਿਓ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਐਜੂਕੇਸ਼ਨ ਨਾਲ ਸੰਬੰਧਿਤ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਵੱਡੇ ਸਵਾਲ ਨੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਬਾਰੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਅਵਜੀਤ ਪਾਠਕ ਜੀ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਜੁੜਨਗੇ ਉਹ ਅੱਜ ਗੱਲਬਾਤ ਕਰਨਗੇ ਬੜਾ ਇੰਪੋਰਟੈਂਟ ਲੈਕਚਰ ਆ ਬਾਕੀ ਦੋਸਤਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਆਪਣੇ ਵਿਦਿਆਰਥੀਆਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਇਸ ਲੈਕਚਰ ਨੂੰ ਜ਼ਰੂਰ ਸਾਂਝਾ ਕਰੋ ਦੋਸਤੋ ਪਿਛਲੇ 1 ਸਾਲ ਤੋਂ ਲਗਾਤਾਰ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਪਿਆਰ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਸਾਥ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਦਸ਼ਮੇਸ਼ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਕਾਲਜ ਮੁਕਸਰ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਸ਼ੁਰੂ ਕੀਤੀ ਗਈ ਲੈਕਚਰ ਸੀਰੀਜ਼ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਅਸੀਂ ਲਗਾਤਾਰ ਇਹਦੇ ਜਰੀਏ ਇੱਕ ਸੰਵਾਦ ਇੱਕ ਡਾਇਲੌਗ ਪੈਦਾ ਕਰਨ ਦੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਆ ਉਹ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਹਾਂ ਤੇ ਅਲੱਗ-ਅਲੱਗ ਵਿਸ਼ਿਆਂ ਦੇ ਹਵਾਲੇ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਅਲੱਗ-ਅਲੱਗ ਡਿਸਪਲਨ ਦੇ ਹਵਾਲੇ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਅਸੀਂ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਗੱਲਬਾਤ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਪੱਕਾ ਲੈਕਚਰਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਤੇ ਇਸ ਲੈਕਚਰ ਸੀਰੀਜ਼ ਦੇ ਅੱਜ ਪੰਜਵੇਂ ਲੈਕਚਰ ਪੰਜਵੇਂ ਲੈਕਚਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਸੀਂ ਅੱਜ ਐਜੂਕੇਸ਼ਨ ਇਨ ਸਰਚ ਆਫ ਫਿਜ਼ੀਏਬਲ ਯੂਟੋਪੀਆਸ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਦੇ ਖੇਤਰ ਚ ਸੰਭਵ ਆਦਰਸ਼ਾਂ ਦੀ ਖੋਜ ਇਸ ਵਿਸ਼ੇ ਦੇ ਹਵਾਲੇ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਅੱਜ ਦੀ ਗੱਲਬਾਤ ਆ ਉਹ ਅਸੀਂ ਕਰਾਂਗੇ ਤੇ ਅੱਜ ਇਸ ਵਿਸ਼ੇ ਬਾਬਤ ਗੱਲਬਾਤ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਜੀਐਨਯੂ ਤੋਂ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਭਾਰਤ ਦੇ ਪ੍ਰਸਿੱਧ ਸਮਾਜ ਸ਼ਾਸਤਰੀ ਤੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਗੈਸਟ ਸਪੀਕਰ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਅਵਿਜੀਤ ਪਾਠਕ ਜੀ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਜੁੜਨਗੇ ਜੋ ਕਿ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਵਿਸ਼ੇ ਦੇ ਬਾਬਤ ਸਾਡੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਵਿਚਾਰ ਆ ਉਹ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਂਝੇ ਕਰਨਗੇ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਅਵਿਜੀਤ ਪਾਠਕ ਜੀ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਨੇ ਸਰ ਆਪਕਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਵਾਗਤ ਹੈ ਦਸ਼ਮੇਸ਼ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਕਾਲਜ ਮੁਕਸਰ ਕੇ ਇਸ ਆਨਲਾਈਨ ਮੰਚ ਮੇ ਹਮਾਰੇ ਕਾਲਜ ਮੈਨੇਜਮੈਂਟ ਕੀ ਤਰਫ ਸੇ ਪ੍ਰਿੰਸੀਪਲ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਗੁਰਜਿੰਦਰ ਸਿੰਘ ਪਰਾਰ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਤਰਫ ਸੇ ਸਮੂਹ ਵਿਦਿਆਰਥੀਆਂ ਕੀ ਤਰਫ ਸੇ ਔਰ ਸਮੂਹ ਸਟਾਫ ਔਰ ਖਾਸ ਤੌਰ ਤੇ ਮੇਰੀ ਤਰਫ ਸੇ ਆਪਕਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਵਾਗਤ ਹੈ ਸਰ ਯਸ ਸ਼ੁਡ ਆਈ ਬਿਗਿਨ ਅ 2 ਮਿੰਟ ਸਰ ओके okay. दोस्तों लेक्चर शुरू करने तो पहला मैं साडे आज दे गेस्ट स्पीकर प्रोफेसर अभिजीत पाठक जी नु जिदा तोडे नाल संक्षेप या तौरफ जरूर साझा करना चाहंगा प्रोफेसर अभिजीत पाठक जी स्कूल ऑफ सोशल
ਦੀ ਟ੍ਰਿਬਿਊਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜੇ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਹਵਾਲੇ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਮੈਂ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਾਂ ਤਾਂ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਟ੍ਰਿਬਿਊਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਤਰਜਮਾ ਹੋ ਕੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਆਰਟੀਕਲ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਆਰਟੀਕਲ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਲਗਾਤਾਰ ਛਪਦੇ ਰਹਿੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਖਾਸ ਤੌਰ ਤੇ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਟ੍ਰਿਬਿਊਨ ਦੇ ਜ਼ਰੀਏ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਪਾਠਕਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਇੱਕ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਤਵਾਰਫ ਰਹੇਗਾ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਜ਼ਰੀਏ ਉਹ ਆਪਣੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਦੇ ਖੇਤਰ ਤੇ ਜੋ ਵੱਖ ਵੱਖ ਵਿਸ਼ਿਆਂ ਦੇ ਹਵਾਲੇ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਗੱਲਬਾਤ ਆ ਉਹ ਕਰਦੇ ਰਹਿੰਦੇ ਸੋ ਅੱਜ ਸਾਡਾ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਅਵਜੀਤ ਪਾਠਕ ਜੀ ਨਾਲ ਜੁੜਨ ਦਾ ਸਵਾਬ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈਗਾ ਉਹ ਐਜੂਕੇਸ਼ਨ ਇਨ ਸਰਚ ਆਫ ਫਿਜ਼ੀਏਬਲ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਯੂਟੋਪੀਆ ਵਿਸ਼ੇ ਕਰਕੇ ਬਣਿਆ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਵਿਸ਼ੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਵਿਚਾਰ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਹੈਗੇ ਆ ਉਹ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਲੈਕਚਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਂਝੇ ਕਰਨਗੇ ਦੋਸਤੋ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਭਾਰਤੀ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਪ੍ਰਣਾਲੀ ਬਾਰੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਅਜੋਕੇ ਦੌਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਵੱਡੇ ਸਵਾਲ ਨੇ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਖਾਸ ਤੌਰ ਤੇ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਅਵਜੀਤ ਪਾਠਕ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਵੀ ਆਪਣੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਲੇਖ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਜਰੀਏ ਉਠਾਇਆ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਅਜੋਕੇ ਦੌਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਇੱਕ ਦੌੜ ਆ ਖਾਸ ਤੌਰ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਬੋਰਡ ਨੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਐਗਜ਼ਾਮ ਲੈਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਸਕੂਲ ਬੋਰਡ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅੰਕਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਦੇਣ ਦੀ ਤੇ ਸਟੂਡੈਂਟਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅੰਕਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਪ੍ਰਾਪਤ ਕਰਨ ਦੀ ਇੱਕ ਦੌੜ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਬਣੀ ਹੋਈ ਆ ਇਸ ਤੋਂ ਇਲਾਵਾ ਜੇ ਆਪਾਂ ਗੱਲ ਕਰੀਏ ਤਾਂ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਸਮੇਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕੋਚਿੰਗ ਸੈਂਟਰ ਨੇ ਇਹ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕਿ ਬ੍ਰਾਂਡ ਅੰਬੈਸਡਰ ਬਣੇ ਹੋਏ ਨੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਸੀਂ ਦੇਖਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਕਿ ਆਸੇ ਪਾਸੇ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਹੋਰਡਿੰਗ ਨੇ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਉਹ ਇਸ਼ਤਿਹਾਰ ਲਾਉਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਟੌਪਰਾਂ ਦੀਆਂ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਤਸਵੀਰਾਂ ਉਹ ਛਪੀਆਂ ਹੁੰਦੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਖਾਸ ਤੌਰ ਤੇ ਰਾਜਸਥਾਨ ਦੇ ਕੋਟਾ ਸੈਂਟਰ ਦੀਆਂ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਜੇ ਆਪਾਂ ਗੱਲ ਕਰੀਏ ਤਾਂ ਉਹ ਇੱਕ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕੋਟਾ ਸੈਂਟਰ ਆ ਉਹ ਇੱਕ ਬ੍ਰਾਂਡ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਬਣ ਕੇ ਸਾਡੇ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਖੇਤਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਆਇਆ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਇੱਕ ਆਪਣੀ ਇੱਕ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹਨੇਰਮਈ ਉਹਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਪੱਖ ਹੈਗਾ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਬੱਚੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਹੈਗੇ ਨੇ ਡਿਪਰੈਸ਼ਨ ਦਾ ਸ਼ਿਕਾਰ ਹੋ ਕੇ ਖੁਦਕੁਸ਼ੀਆਂ ਕਰਦੇ ਨੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਸੁਪਨੇ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਉਥੋਂ ਨਿਰਾਸ਼ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਜਾਂ ਉਥੋਂ ਕਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਸਟੂਡੈਂਟ ਨਿਕਲਦੇ ਨੇ ਇਹ ਇੱਕ ਆਪਣੇ ਆਪ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਵਾਲ ਨੇ ਇਸ ਤੋਂ ਇਲਾਵਾ ਖੁੰਬਾ ਵਾਂਗ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਉਗਰੀਆਂ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਦੁਕਾਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀਆਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੁਕਾਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਅੱਖਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਚੰਦਿਆ ਦੇਣ ਵਾਲੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਇਸ਼ਤਿਹਾਰ ਨੇ ਇਹ ਸਾਡੀ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਕਈ ਸਾਡੀ ਜੋ ਕਿ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਪ੍ਰਣਾਲੀ ਤੇ ਕਈ ਵੱਡੇ ਸਵਾਲ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਉਹ ਪੈਦਾ ਕਰਦੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਤੇ ਇੱਥੇ ਉਹ ਇੱਕ ਸਵਾਲ ਉੱਠਦਾ ਕਿ ਅਜੋਕੇ ਸਮੇਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਸਾਡੀ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਪ੍ਰਣਾਲੀ ਆ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹਕੀਕੀ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਅਸਲ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਉਹ ਕਿੱਥੇ ਗਵਾਚ ਗਈ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਕੀ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਸਮਿਆਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਸੀਂ ਰਵਿੰਦਰਨਾਥ ਟੈਗੋਰ ਜਾਂ ਪਾਲਿਓ ਫਰੇਰਾ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਦਾ ਮਾਡਲ ਸੀ ਜਾਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਦੇ ਆਈਡੀਆ ਸੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਦੇ ਆਈਡੀਆ ਸੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਇੰਪਲੀਮੈਂਟ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਤੇ ਵਿਚਾਰ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਜੋ ਕਿ ਸਾਡੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਬਾਜ਼ਾਰ ਸਿਹਤ ਸਾਡੀ ਜੋ ਕਿ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਪ੍ਰਣਾਲੀ ਹੈ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਗਹਿਰੀ ਤੇ ਪਾਏਦਾਰ ਚੀਜ਼ ਦੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਕਮੀ ਮਹਿਸੂਸ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਆ ਸੀ ਉਹਦੀ ਗੱਲਬਾਤ ਅਸੀਂ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਜੋ ਕਿ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਪ੍ਰਣਾਲੀ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੀਆਂ ਜੋ ਕਿ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਪ੍ਰਣਾਲੀ ਦੀ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਰਵਾਇਤਾਂ ਬਣ ਚੁੱਕੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਤੋਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਪਾਰ ਜਾ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਇਸ ਸਮੇਂ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਟੈਕਨੋ ਕਾਰਪੋਰੇਟ ਸਾਮਰਾਜ ਦੀ ਸੇਵਾ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਸਾਡੀ ਜੋ ਕਿ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਪ੍ਰਣਾਲੀ ਲੱਗੀ ਹੋਈ ਆ ਇਸ ਤੇ ਆਧਾਰਤ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਸਾਡੀ ਸਿੱਖਿਆ ਚੱਲ ਰਹੀ ਆ ਉਹਦੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਅਹਿਮ 
as a teacher, as a student, the way I have engaged with the system of education, looked at it, experienced it, experimented with it. So that is the first point that I wish to make it clear. So there is an experiential element, there is a quest, and there is a critic. And the second point before I begin that I wish to make is that, you know, I know that this is a forum where, you know, a multilingual forum. Uh, some of you are more comfortable with Punjabi language, some of you are comfortable in Hindi. Now, there is a limitation because I'm speaking in English and I see it as my limitation that I could not speak it in your own language in Punjabi. Uh, nevertheless, I want to assure you that whatever I'm going to speak and the way I'm going to speak, my language seeks to communicate. My language does not want to demonstrate or exhibit the burden of scholarship or the burden of jargon and technical medium. Because I tend to believe that language is enabling and language should flow like a river. And the river has a rhythmic flow and the river has its own depth. So the way I'm going to speak and the language I'm going to speak, apart from eliminating you and causing a heavy burden of scholarship of the technical idioms, I would speak in a language that would flow like a river. I would speak in a way that seeks to communicate, seeks to establish a bond with you as a listener, and create a moment of communion and togetherness so that collectively this evening we can evolve, we can grow, we can work together, we can learn, and we can unlearn. As I've said, that a river flows and it has a depth. Likewise, I tend to believe that if our discourse flows like a river, then it will also have its depth. There is no contradiction between being lyrical and having the substance and the depth. Sometimes this is a mistake many academicians make, and as a result, they reduce their knowledge into an egotistic burden of scholarship. And that is something I wish to debunk, I wish to deconstruct. Because I have always believed theory has the poetry, and the poetry has the theory. So with this clarity, with this clarification, now let us begin, let us have a conversation and dialogue. And to begin with, let me share some of ideas with you. And I'm sure as alert observers, as alert artists, thinkers, those who are thinking and reflecting on the culture of learning, pedagogy, education, you need not necessarily agree with me. The purpose is not that we arrive at a perfect consensus. The purpose of a forum, I believe, is to create a dialogic environment, dialogic meaning. You and I evolve the profound art of listening. You and I begin to listen to one another, argue, counter-argue, and let us see whether at the end the, our horizons get expanded. So I would expect observations, reflections, questions, amendments, suggestions from you, because I trust you, you are an eager, alert, you know, participant, an observer, you are not merely a passive listener. So, you know, let me begin, as I speak of education, let me begin with the everyday, with a very simple everyday illustration. And Lagni has pointed out in the introduction, let me begin with this everydayness. Because I believe everydayness is very important. Begin with what you and I are seeing, you know, smelling in the world around us. And then from there, let's go deeper, theorize it, philosophize it, and try to see the relationship between the everydayness of the world and something which is deeper, structural, philosophical, theoretical. So let me begin with an everyday illustration. 
the vote results, as we saw, just after the declaration of vote results, beat CBSC or different state votes. And then whenever you open the newspapers, and I wrote it in one of my recent articles in the Tribune, and when you open the newspaper, you just see the whole page ads of branded coaching centers. And many of these toppers, both toppers, IDG toppers, you know, they seem to be the brand ambassadors of these coaching centers. Branded coaching centers in the whole page ad of different newspapers, English newspapers, Hindi newspapers, Punjabi newspaper, Bengali newspaper, regional newspapers. And together with those ads of these coaching centers, you also see this is the admission time. Those who have passed the school, they would come to the colleges, universities, polytechnics, institutes of technology, management. So you could see the ads of any number of institutes, fancy private universities, institutes of technology and management. And you could see the huge ads of those institutions. And you could see how these institutions now tempt their potential customers. And one way of tempting the potential customers is that the kind of knowledge capsule that these institutes could provide is a sheer road to your economic social mobility with the mythology of placement and the salary package. So the placement and the salary package would occupy a big space in the ads of those, you know, mushrooming growth of fancy education shops, institutes of technology, management, the private universities, institutes, and together with the coaching centers and our toppers as brand ambassadors of the coaching center. Likewise, as I have observed, and I just wish to share with you, come to any bookshop today, an average bookshop, in a small town and the city, you'd see that the 80% of the space of the bookshop has been occupied by what coaching centers regard as success mantras. All sorts of guide books, how to crack the IITG, how to crack these entrance tests, guidebook with all this MCQ pattern of questions, physics, mathematics, chemistry, biology, social sciences, all that. So full of those books. And one thing, if you are a keen observer of the everyday life, that would strike you is that you see that hardly you find an average bookshop where you find the kind of literature that actually illumines our consciousness, that expands our knowledge, that makes us think and reflect. Say, for example, a collection of short stories by Chekhov a novel by Rabindranath Tagore, you know, or a philosophical text by Barton Russell, things of that kind, the books with which you and I grew up, you know, when we evolved and grew, you know, began to see the world. The books which are not textbooks, the books which are not guidebooks, the books that does not assure me how to crack the entrance test, but the books that illumine my consciousness the books that become your lifelong companion. You could see the growing disappearance of the books of this kind. And I often say that our bookshops now have been colonized by the guidebooks, you know, in great literature, great philosophy, the books that change the world, that make us see the world differently, critically, creatively, seem to be disappearing from the bookshops. So that is another observation. And all of you, if you are a keen observer, open the newspapers, talk to the youngsters, anxiety-ridden parents, look at the bookshops, roam around, see the rapidly growing coaching centers in your neighborhood, in your locality. I believe you won't take much time to agree with me. So that's the scenario which we see. And then I often ask myself this question, that all these youngsters 
16 year, 17 year old young students who have just begun their life. Such a wonderful age they are in. They are 16, 17, 18. But see the world they have inherited. See the kind of education they have experienced. So I ask myself whether a youngster of this kind has ever looked at the sky and then with absolute wonder asked some critical questions about the cosmos, about the universe. And with that spirit of wonder and curiosity has begun to study physics. Have they ever found a teacher who has told them that, my dear, physics is not just Akash brilliant and Fiji physics. Physics is a depth. Physics has a meaning. Physics is the build, bridge that you would build to understand the world, the way the physical universe, the way the cosmos, the functions, its function. Look at the sky. Ask different questions. Go to the depth of astrophysics. Look at the natural world. Think of the world, the way it functions. Understand the basic principles of physics and see how numbers play a very important role in life and how mathematics like poetry is a language that we need to make sense of the part of the world, you know. Now, has it, have they ever found a teacher who has engaged with mathematics and physics in this way? Or is it that right from the day one, they have grown up with coaching center gurus who have come forward only with certain kind of knowledge capsules, guidebooks, and success mantras. And then in the age of MCQ, this inflated marks in the board exam. Does the 99% marks in English necessarily indicate that your child and my child is being fascinated by Walt Whitman and T.S. Eliot and Rabindranath Tagore or Munshi Premchand? Does 100% in physics necessarily mean that the child is bothered by the kind of questions that once made Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein sleepless and made them see, explore, examine, probe into the functioning of the physical universe. Now, it seems that this wonder, the curiosity, the critical engagement, these faculties of learning, we are ruthlessly killing. And the only thing that is emerging is the notion of being a hyper-competitive exam warrior. How to crack all these exams from the IITG to the UPSC. Now, this is where we see the mental landscape of many of our young students. And this is something that I feel tend to be worried about. So the other day, I read this novel time and again. The other day I was again looking at the pages of a great novel by Harman K. Shittharth here. And I'm sure many of you have read that novel. Now Shittharth in quest, in search, Shittharth as a wanderer. And Shittharth is moving around to understand the truth of life, truth of existence, the rhythm of life and death, the phenomenon of impermanence, form and formlessness. Now in the process of that quest, Shiva happened to come near a river and he saw an old boatman, you know. But Shiva was not in a hurry. Shiva was not willing to take the boat and cross the river. But Shiva one day asked that boatman that I want to understand the river. I want to know the river. And that old boatman was surprised he said for the first time, I am seeing a man of this kind. So far, I have seen only people who see the river as an obstacle and who wish to cross the river and go to the other side of the river, maybe a temple, a marketplace, a bank or something. But nobody is interested in the river. But for the first time, I am seeing that you are interested in the river. And Shiddharth and the boat man began to sit near the river night after night and one night the river actually began to speak and river spoke in many languages and Shiddharth understood those languages. A very metaphorical, symbolic illustration, friends, 
I just share with you. It is the eagerness of a love. It is the spirit of being a wanderer. It is the eternal curiosity of knowing, exploring, understanding. And so I sometimes ask myself, have these students absolutely brainwashed, colonized by coaching centers, anxiety-ridden parents, success mantras, and the formula of quick, instantaneous success, MCQ pattern of exams, inflated board marks, have they ever found in their life a teacher, the kind of teacher that she had found in the boatman? Or for example, a poet like Whitman, Walt Whitman, could whisper into the ears of these youngsters, 16 years, 17 years, 18 years, my dear, just look at the world around you. Look at a tree, look at the star. Don't you see, as Whitman himself wrote, to me, every inch of space is a miracle. The mountain is a miracle. The sea is a miracle. The fish that swims into the river is a miracle. Now, has he ever found that, a teacher of that kind? Has he ever found a teacher like Rabindranath Tagore, you know, the kind of teacher that Tagore imagined, and a teacher who would say that it is not the fault of the child if he is not come to the world with the knowledge of algebra and English grammar. Child is a seeker. Child is a wanderer. Just nurture the child. Allow her natural curiosity to evolve. Enable him to relate to the rhythm of nature and the child like a flower would bloom. But how quickly we destroy that possibility. We kill that possibility. We destroy that imagination. And that is, I believe, something to be worried about. So when I share these experiences with many, with friends, with students, with colleagues, with parents, many of them abuse me as YouTube. And I see in their language, they're abusing me. They say, oh, you are utopian. You are utopian. This is not the way things do happen. I know this is not the way things are happening. This is not the world of Tagore and Whitman. This is not the world of Paul Freire and Rabindranath Tagore. This is not the world of Henry Giro and uh, Bell Hooks. I know this is not the world. This is the world of coaching center groups. This is the world of Fiji Akash and Brilliant. This is the world of bright books and success mantras. This is the world driven by a neoliberal notion of success. This is the world in which the market colonizes every sphere of life. I'm not idiot. I'm not stupid. I'm not naive. I know how the world functions. But at the same time, I know that what the system regards today as utopias, as impossible utopias, in those utopias lies the seat of a new age, seat of the possibility of collective redemption. And that's why Gandhi knew, to take a simple illustration, that he lived in a violent world. Gandhi knew that he was not living in a non-violent world. It is a world of technological violence. It was a world of totalitarianism. It is a world of colonial invasion and violence. It was a world of fascism, authoritarianism, Stalinism, Hitlerism. Gandhi knew that. Gandhi's eyes were open. But then Gandhi dared to experiment, not with violence, but Gandhi dared to experiment with Ahimsa, with non-violence, with soul force. So in other words, it was this quest for another life, another possibility, another imagination that led Gandhi to experiment with truth and to resist what he was seeing in his time, a violent world. Tagore knew that it said the system looked like a machine and the armor, but the Tagore knew that the system is so denaturalized. It has denaturalized our consciousness. The wonder has disappeared from life. Yet Tagore dared to experiment, and Tagore dared to transform his utopia into a possibility in the educational experiment that he sought to create at his own educational project at Shantinikatan at his own time. So what I am saying that the system has a logic of its own. And I want you to be aware of the politics of that logic. The politics of this logic is that 
there is no alternative. And any notion of an alternative is under, negated, thrown into dustbin as an impossible project, as a utopia, as something that cannot happen, as a daydream, as a fantasy. Because only when you throw it into dustbin, you negate it as a daydream, as a fantasy, as a utopia, as an impossible utopia, then the system can legitimate itself, can justify itself. The more you say, Fear, Whitman, Tagore, Ben Hooks, Henry Chiro, all of fear, Ivan Illich are utopian, the more the business of the coaching centers, the more the education shops as factories would function and work. They would like you to believe that everything is nonsense, from Tagore to Freer, from Gandhi to Jiddu Krishnamurti to Leo Tolstoy to Bell Hooks to Paulo Freer, everybody is has to be thrown into dust. They're just utopia. And if you use the word utopia, you ridicule it. You seek to throw it into the dust. That's the power of the colonization of the mind. The mind has been colonized by the system, by the market, by the instantaneous logic of instrumental reasoning and success. And that colonized mind refuses to see the possibility in other things. And that is always being regarded as an impossible utopia. But I call it a feasible utopia. Because these utopias are the seeds of truth. These utopias have to be nurtured, have to be cultivated. And once we nurture and cultivate these utopias, and you and I, in our small sphere, in our everyday life, as a parent, as a teacher, as a civil society activist, as a citizen, you know, seek to implement, seek to try, seek to experiment with a new possibility of learning and unlearning, critical pedagogy, culture of learning, then what you call utopia, it would become a feasible utopia. It would become a possibility. We could move towards that. And that's the thing why I felt like speaking on a theme of this kind. So friends, I believe I have succeeded in making it sufficiently clear the context in which I am speaking. So having said that, now let me just share with you that there are two doors, two entry points through which I am entering into the discourse. One is of course, you know, some of the discourse of critical pedagogy that with which I have been formed as a student and as a teacher. And also as a teacher, my experiment with those critical pedagogy, where I have engaged in the process of a dialogue with some of the great pedagogues, contemporary great pedagogues from all over the world. Notably, Ivan Illich, Paulo Freire, Henry Giro, Bell Hooks, that Afro-American feminist who has written against racism, written against you know, uh, 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 colonialism, different principles of oppression, and uh, spoken about education and engaged pedagogy and the pedagogy of hope and love. So from Paul Freire to Ivan Elich to Bell Hooks uh, to Henry Giro and other. So this is a branch of ideas, the branch of thinkers with which I try to engage, not merely in terms of abstraction, not merely for writing yet another academic paper, but actually to practice it in the classrooms, to practice it in life, to practice it in the classroom. So that is one kind of an entry point. And the second entry point is that my engagement with some of the big thinkers and the philosophers and the wonders in the field of education. Who have not part or not necessarily part of the university system or the university discourse of social sciences. They were not the ones with the PhDs in history and political economy and sociology with n number of publications in academic journals, but they were great visionaries, great thinkers. Say Jiddu Krishnamurti as a wanderer, Rabindranath Tagore as a poet, you know, Sri Aurobindo as a sage philosophers, all of them written, 
spoke extensively and thought brilliantly about pedagogy, about learning and education. So these are the two doors through which I just wish to enter the theme of the discussion and have a conversation with you. In other words, in my mental landscape, my mental landscape is sufficiently elastic that embraces Paul Fair on the one hand and Rabindranath Tagore on the other, that embraces Hindu Henry Jiro, a profound critic of neoliberalism in our time, and also a Jiro Krishnamurti as a wanderer. So it embraces critical Marxism on the one hand, critical left on the one hand, new left, critical left thinking on the one hand, on the other, the rights of Gandhi and Tagore on the other. In other words, I am not reductionist. I am not deterministic. It's not that I live with a sense of untouchability. I work, seek to work with Marx as well as Gandhi, Tagore as well as Henry Jiro, Paulo Freire as well as Rabindranath Tagore. So with this elasticity, non-reductionism, non-determinism, I seek to evolve and grow as a teacher, as a student, and this is the experiment with pedagogy and the learning you know, that I believe these physical utopias and trying to translate those physical utopias every day into our practice of learning and unlearning and classroom practices. So let me first enter through the first door, you know, the critical pedagogues like Paul Fair, Ivan Elich, and others. You are so well versed this audience, so it doesn't require much elaboration. And you know that when you read a fantastic book by Ivan Elich, you know, a celebrated book, De Schooling Society, you know that, for example, the experience of reading the book for the first time, I tend to believe, is the experience of reading Karl Marx's economic and philosophic manuscripts for the first time or the Communist Manifesto for the first time, or Gandhi's Hind Swaraj for the first time. Because it makes you think. It leads to a process of inner charm. It makes things upside down. It unsettles the world that you have taken for granted. It makes you see the world through a different vantage point. It is disturbing. And the fact that it is disturbing, there is great beauty, great joy, great learning, and unlearning experience. So see that we are all part of the school society because to live in a state-centric modern society is to live in a school society. Schools, as Elijah would say, are the secular churches in the modern industrial state-centric societies. So schools surround our existence and your journey begins right from your three-old baby uh, goes to the play school and to the day she submits her PhD thesis in the university. So she passes through a unilinear ladder. So it is a graded learning. It is a graded learning. And the school society makes me believe that the more years I have passed in school, the more educated I am. And there is no meaningful education outside school and the formalization. So schools would certify my intelligence not only in physics, mathematics, and English grammar, schools should certify my moral character. And this just as Orbin Kejriwal would like us to believe, schools should certify whether I am a sufficient deshma or whether I am a sufficient patriot. You know, so schools would certify everything, my emotional intelligence, my mathematical reasoning, my knowledge of physics, my knowledge of literature, and nothing beyond what schools provide is real education. And that's why the schools are all part of it. But this graded learning creates, as Illich argued, a conditioned mind, a hierarchical mind. So the fact that today, when I came to the play school, I was told by my fancy English teacher that A means apple. And when I came to the university, I was told by my supervisor that A means Althusser. So through graded learning, I have evolved. I am more educated because I no longer say A is apple. 
I say if is Althusser. I no longer say if is Fox. I say if is Foucault. So that is the graded learning school set made me think. So my mind begins to think in terms of hierarchy, duality. So the more years I've spent in school, the more educated I am, the more snobbish I am, the more arrogant I am. So although I know nothing about agriculture, about harvesting, about crops, but the fact that I have come to the school, come to the college and the university, I have every right to regard my grandfather who never came to school as illiterate. Although my grandfather had great knowledge about harvesting, about crops, about agriculture, about folk tales and the folk music. But since he didn't go to school, the system has given me the right to declare him an illiterate. So as Illich would say, that the schools have already created a hierarchical, competitive, conditioned mind. And this conditioned, hierarchical, competitive mind cannot relate, cannot see that real meaningful learning in life takes place outside formal curriculum, outside formal institutions, you know. So it has made us so conditioned. And that's why we become more and more dependent today on experts and specialists in everyday life. Have not your friend noticed that today there is a professional storyteller for your child? That you yourself have lost the art of storytelling. Grandparents have disappeared from our small three-member family norms in the urban apartments. So you need a professional storyteller to tell a child the stories. Likewise, your child birthday party have to be organized by the event managers. And even at the time of wedding, the kind of dress that your son or the daughter would wear, that would be decided by a fashion designer. So for everything today, from you know art of storytelling to the dress that I would wear, you know, to the way I would celebrate my child's birthday party, for everything. Now there are outside specialists and experts. In other words, we are becoming increasingly disempowered. We are becoming increasingly disempowered. We are becoming incapable of making our own choices in everyday life. And this is what Illich calls that we need to de-school the mind, the de-school the consciousness. We ought to see that meaningful learning is not the monopoly of school. The way it is not the monopoly of the church or the temple and the mosque to tell me whether I am religious or spiritual. I might not go to the temple. I might not go to the Hanuman temple every Tuesday. I might not follow any ritual. But I might be deeply spiritual. I might be deeply spiritual. I might have a sense of wonder. I might have experienced the glimpses of the infinite. You know, but I might not go to the temple. I might not believe in the priests. You know, so likewise, that it is possible that you have not done a PhD in history, you have not done a PhD in philosophy, but you are deeply philosophical, you are deeply reflexive. So the other day, I cracked a joke with a young student. Imagine that Rabindranath Tagore and Jiddu Krishnamurti applied for college lectureship or even school teacher today in Punjab or in Delhi, their application forms would be rejected. Well, because Tagore didn't qualify the net exam in Bengali literature. Tagore didn't have a PhD in Bangla. Jiru Krishnamurti didn't have a PhD in theology or philosophy. So their application forms would be rejected. And that is why, for example, Schools have monopolized our consciousness, the credit learning. And that's why we become incapable of expanding our horizon, breaking those walls, and looking at the world differently, creatively, critically, meaningfully, and establish a communion. You know? So that, I think, gave me a vantage point to look at education 
somewhat differently and meaningful. Second, I would say, with Paulo Freire, it is a great experience when you read Paulo Freire's pedagogy of the operas and just see that how beautiful this passionate, extraordinarily gifted pedagogue and thinker is making you and me to think and do that. So he says that see what is happening, you know, that this education, the dominant prevalent education, robs you and me of our voice, of our criticality, of our reflexivity, of our sensitivity, of our language. Instead, it imposes itself on us. It is based on monologue. It is anti-dialogic. It is based on the supremacy of the power of the teacher. It is based on a hierarchical, unequal relationship between the teacher and the taught. It is not a problem posing education. Instead, it is as follow with a metaphorical language uses, it is a banking education. The way you and I open our account in the web and then we deposit the money. Similarly, it is said that you and I are empty vessels, come to our schools and colleges, and all these experts and specialists and the teachers are filling these empty vessels with all sorts of theories and the information and the knowledge. And you and I, as learners, are just supposed to be passive consumers or the passive receivers of those ideas, theories, and the bookish knowledge that the professor, the teacher, is constantly importing, bombarding on us. Say, for example, mechanically like a parrot, you repeat the 10 reasons for the downfall of the Mughal Empire. Or mechanically like a parrot, a child just recalls the formula and calculates the area of a trapezium. So, you know, this is what, you know, that your own curiosity, your own questioning, your own spirit, that is being ruthlessly denied in the class. It is anti-dialogic, anti-reflexive. It is more based on monologue. So if, and that perpetuates the logic of operation, if the classroom is anti-dialogic, if the classroom is non-reflexive, then the mind cannot be democratic. The mind cannot be egalitarian. The philosophy of liberation, the philosophy of freedom, the praxis of democracy and freedom is impossible if the education is not liberating, if the education is not dialogic. So an agent of emancipation, an agent of political praxis of liberation would require a dialogic problem posing education. The critical pedagogy that makes the learner not a passive consumer and receiver, but a creator, but a reflexive, critically nuanced, creative thinker who just does not receive what the professor is saying, who together with the professor asks critical questions, works together and raises new questions, makes new observation, problematizes the world, and as teacher and students, as collective wanderers trying to explore the world and raise new questions together. And that is what we call the dialogic education. And that is the pedagogy of the oppressed, because the pedagogy of the oppressor is the monology. It is non-dialogic, non-critical, non-reflexive. And pedagogy of the oppressed would begin with the reflexivity, with dialogue, with criticality. So it was like saying that I come to the classroom, suppose I'm a child and I'm in class seven and eight, and my civics teacher comes to the classroom today, and civics teacher just repeats what is written in the civics text of say NCRT or any state textbook book and says that ours is a secular democratic country. And, and there is a two mark question. And like a parrot, I have to believe that ours is a secular democratic country. And I have to say that ours is a secular democratic country. And suppose one day I ask that ma'am, you say that ours is a secular democratic country and even the book has written it but it seems it is not. It's a country 
but the minorities are stigmatized, subjugated, condemned every day. It is a country where there is a rampant majoritarianism. There is a violence of majoritarianism. It's a country where, for example, the minorities live with perpetual insecurity. It is a country of the cacophony of noisy slogans. So how can you say that ours is a secular democratic country? Now, had Paul Flair been there, been an observer, Paul Flair would have said, only with that question of that young child. And if the teacher now addresses that question, and then the teacher tells the child, yes, my dear, I am happy that you have raised this question. Then collectively, let's problematize this given knowledge that ours is a secular democratic country. Now ask a difficult question. Is it actually true today that ours is a secular democratic country? Then a dialogic education would be done, not a banking education. In banking education, I'm just supposed to remember, record it, and just to write, omitting my exam paper, and get 100 out of 100, and it is finished. Yeah. And this is where a new pedagogy emerges. That question, that interrogates, that gives a critical reflexive voice to the learner and makes the teacher, not all-knowing teacher, but teacher also with the openness, with the flexibility, and constantly working with the student and collectively trying to explore the world. But see our system of learning, even today, even many of our leading universities, you would see that the teachers do not encourage questions in the classrooms. Teachers do not feel comfortable with the disturbing questions come to the classroom. Teachers want their students to mechanically note even the comma semicolon what the teacher is saying. You know, the culture of guidebooks, the culture of those exam notes, you know. And that is why that when you read Paul and when I share this book with my young learners, with my students, then I believe something happens. We begin to rethink learning, rethink education. And likewise. When, for example, Bell Hooks today speaks of the classroom as a domain of possibilities, classroom as a possibility of love for the teacher and the student, not cynically, critically, but with the abundance of love for the world, for the ecosystem, for egalitarianism, for profound humanism, are evolving, trying to redefine learning create a new praxis of learning, education as a inner churning and the inner flowering and with criticality, not negativity and nihilism and not cynicism, with criticality, criticality endowed with love, classroom as a possibility, a pedagogy of hope to create a new world, to strive for a new world. Or the way Henry Chiro in our time in his speech after speech, writing after writing, only the other day at Jamia Media Islamia organized his talk. I was just listening to his talk uh, one time. And his profound critique of today what the new liberalism has done to the sphere of education. You know, the way you and I today are transformed into mere resources. The resources that have to be trained by what I'm saying, coaching centers, and all these institutes of technology and management. And then these resources have to be utilized, used, manipulated, exploited in name, the name of productivity by the techno corporate empire. And we would become well fed, well clothed slips of the techno corporate empire. The mythology of placement and salary package. And the mythology and the large project of educational ambition. I'm sorry to say that drives many of our IIT and IIM students is essentially heavily governed by this new liberal package that I wish to be a well-fed, well-clothed slave of the techno corporate empire. It's like a magician. The neoliberal market is a magician with a stick in hand. I am a slave, but I am a slave now of a different kind. The ancient slavery was very crude, was visible, but slavery through the logic of market seduction is not so visible. 
and you need a critical pedagogue like Paul of Fair or even Elitch or Bell Books or Henry Giro to understand that chain, you know, that stick the corporate master in their hand. And you and I just, you know, are working under that, you know. And this is where the critical pedagogy, and that's why it is so disturbing. And that's why all of us were so used to this system and who get also have got some benefits out of this system are so uncomfortable with critical pedagogy, are so unhappy with any question that interrogates the prevalent system. And since we cannot bear it, we have an easy way out. We say, oh, it's idealistic, it is utopian. Ah, it is all this Gandhian, Marxist, Polyferian talk. It has no meaning. It is the daydream of some idealists, you know. It has no will because that is the only way they could respond to it because they could not respond to it meaningfully because if they want to respond to it meaningfully they have to ask a lot of critical questions to themselves about the damage that the prevalent system of education has done to us you know that's why as i'm saying that be it Ivan Illich, Paul Freire, you know Ben Hooks or Henry Giro it's but extraordinarily illuminating leading to certain kind of a new discourse, new thinking of education. So that's my first book. And let me now enter through the second book. And my second book, it has come from, say, as I'm saying, as a non-reductionist, as an elastic thinker who embraces, who does not exclude, who embraces, you know, I do not suffer from philosophic untouchability because I feel that it has destroyed the mind at the university circuit I would see that Ambedkarites would never feel happy if someone speaks even a good word about Gandhi. Gandhians would not feel very happy if someone speaks something positive about the Marxist. Marxists would feel very unhappy if someone says, no, this is something remarkable about Gandhi. This closeness irritates me. This closed, reductionist, deterministic mind doesn't help us to grow and to evolve. And I always tend to believe that a learner, a young learner, has begun the journey. And why so early a learner would close all the windows of consciousness? As if born as a Marxist and die as a Marxist, born as a Mambedkarite and die as an Ambedkarite, and in between nothing happened in your life. Nothing made you rethink. Nothing changed your life. Nothing cost you wonder. Nothing made you exile. You took the world for granted. You felt so confident about one lens that you do not want to see the world through other lens. That, I think, is very non-critical, very reductionist, you know, and very anti-education, you know. And many of my uh, politically correct friends do not agree with me. That's a different story. Uh, uh, but let me uh, see that how through the second door uh, we, we, uh, we enter. So as I said, that uh, Fair and Henry Giro and Ivan Illich and Ben Hooks on the one hand, heavily driven by new left, critical Marxism, psychoanalysis, critical thinking, and on the other, the spiritual wonder, philosophic wonder, poetic revelation, Tagore, Aurobindo, Krishnamurti. Now, just let me begin. And let me begin uh, with someone here who, uh, if Gandhi experimented with politics, now Tagore experimented not only with poetry, with literature, with philosophy, Tagore experimented with education and uh, not only wrote and reflected on education. In his brief essays, in his essay on the poet's school, in his writings on education, and then in his concrete experimentation, the kind of imagination with which he sought to play. Now, just before I speak, just I won't take much time, I will just say something that see the mind of Tagore and most of you are well aware, but when we enter into his domain of education, I feel like making just two points. One, just see that the Tagore's a religiosity. And in one of his essays, Tagore would write that my religion is not organized, institutionalized religion. My religion is not the religion of religious pundits and the scholars and the priests. My religion is not the religion of scriptures, you know. Scriptures may have their importance, 
Gita, Quran, Bible, all this may have their importance. But he says, my religion is the religiosity of your hunger, religiosity of your poor. And in one of his remarkable songs, he says that I just look at the world around me. I look at the past universe. I see the sky is full of stars, sun, moon, planets. I walk into the earth. I see the trees, the forests. I see a leaf falling from the tree. I see a river flowing. And I find myself that my heart is filled with a sense of gratitude. That I am not alone. I am not insulated. I find myself amid this vast cosmos, past that universe. I am not separated from the leaf that is falling from the tree. I am not separated from the river that is flowing through my town. I am not separated from the mountain peak that I am seeing. I am part of this universe. And as a result, there is a sense of gratitude that envelops my consciousness. In other words, there is a sense of wonder. And friend, think of it. The age of modernity, and where even a social scientist like Max Weber reflected on it, this age of modernity has also a price to pay. And that price is the price of disenchantment. In the age of modernity, many of us live in the sense of disenchantment. This, we have become so denaturalized and we grow evolved with so much of objective, mathematical, secular reasoning that the relatedness with the cosmos, the wonder and the mystery of the cosmos and the universe seems to have disappeared from the world. In the Baconian Cartesian world, the tree does not have a wonder or the river does not have a mystery. It is a resource to be manipulated for techno development for building a dam, for creating electricity, for transforming the tree into the wood, into the furniture, into the newspaper print. You know, so it's a resource. But in the poet songs, as that song we say, that there is an enchantment. So from Oedrian disenchantment to a poetic enchantment, we could see in the tableau. And likewise, we could see that Tagore's profound critique of what he called the very bounded narcissistic nationalism. The very bounded narcissistic nationalism. As he says that there is, there is a great surplus in human possibility. You know, human being, human soul seeks to expand, grow, evolve, you know, relate, communicate. And if you constrain it with something very limiting, bounded, be it in the name of a fixed identity, religion, caste, nation, you limit that human possibility. That's why Tagore says man's religiosity is man's quest for the surplus. It is beyond his limiting identity, you know, limiting utility. It is a quest for the universe, for something that is bigger, higher, greater than the boundedness. He calls it, it is a rhythmic bridge between the finite and the infinite. I experience the finite, infinite in the finite, and I see the finite in the infinite, you know, and the way you try to see. So that's why it's a critique of a very bounded, militaristic, narcissistic nationalism. And in today's context, reading Tagore's essays on nationalism, Tagore's a completely different meaning, so refreshing. It seems to give me a way out at a time when you leave amid toxic nationalism. You know, so Tagore was saying that when you are guided by a very narrow, bounded nationalism, it destroys the creative flow of life energy. It destroys your quest for the abundance. You and I are supposed to strive for something higher. You know, you and I are not supposed to become merely a Hindu, merely a Muslim, merely a Christian and follow blindly what the priests of the organized religion ask us to do, or the militant nationalists ask us to do. You and I are supposed to strive for something higher, nobler, bigger. And it was this quest that led Tagore to write one of the famous poems in the Vedanta, that when he imagined India through metaphor, it's an ocean. It's not a militaristic nation. It's an ocean. It's an ocean where 
all the tides, multiple rivers and the multiple currents are constantly marching, melting. India is the process of becoming rather than a defined, refined, finished, fixed product, you know. So it is a continual process of evolving and becoming, you know. Mother Teresa with her work, redefining India. Andrews during the time of freedom struggle, redefined India. Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan with his companion with Gandhi in his time, redefined India. Bismillah Khan at Dasashamit Ghat playing Senai, redefining India. India is not the monopoly of those who are engaged with the cacophony of Joy Sera. You know, so this is where, for example, the mind. And no wonder Tagore would rethink education, reimagine education, pedagogy. And one of the fundamental principles he would say that the first aspect of liberty in education is that we have to question the denaturalization, the fragmentation. Instead, the child grows with the relatedness of the nature, with the world around him, you know, and the natural spontaneity within the child, the nature inside and the nature out there. It is this relationship that has to be born. So the child, so everything, be it a tree, be it a river, be it the whisper of the tree, be it the sky full of stars in the evening, be it the hide and seek of the moon in a full moon night and the dark clouds covering the moon and the moon trying to come out of it, everything is a text. Text is not something, an NCRT book that has to be covered that everything, the my life is a text. So the natural world in which I live. So, and this is what you would call modern topo, an abundance of nature. And that is, he says, my challenge is to create a modern topo in a 20th century society. And with that idea, the imagination of Shantini came into being. That you grow with that environment. And I often tell, that, you know, that how wonderful it would have been with Tago uh, to learn what, you know, in our classrooms we kill every day. See, in our classrooms, when our English teacher tells that famous poem by kids, that a thing of beauty is joy forever. And that is being taught in a closed classroom in presence of the CCTV camera. And the principal is observing, you know, and... Um, and the teacher is saying that the thing of beauty is joy forever and teaching kids in a completely non-poetic and non-dialogic way. But imagine how wonderful it would have been had these kids been communicated to a child by a pedagogue nurtured by Tango. You know, then possibly the kid, instead of mechanically cramming kids in a closed classroom, would have played run, laughed, cracked jokes, looked at the tree, looked at a tiny blue flower, heard the whisper of the tree and looked at the sky and then read kids and possibly could have said, oh, there are moments when kids is so correct, so round. It is great to see that tiny blue flower blooming. It is great to see that it is radiating without advertising itself. It is so beautiful. It is so subtle. It is so soft. There could have become a sense of wonder and the child himself could have become a poem rather than just writing a too much serious question like that why did kids say that a thing of beauty is joy for later? So the poetry being killed every day in our non-dialogic, non-reflexive, surveillance-centric classroom. Now, how wonderful it would have been had there been a pedagogue nurtured by the likes of Tagore. And then the second thing Tagore would say, that our conventional academics, mode of learning, has created a duality between serious teacher-centric activities and what the school calls extracurricular activities. So they call it extracurricular. The moment you say it is extracurricular, you have already hierarchized it. So in the child's mind, it is said that serious work is a teacher-directed activity when the teacher comes to the class 
and teaches NCERT physics, NCERT history, and NCERT mathematics. And extracurricular is doing something here and there, you know, that is not important. And that actually is, even that play is temporary res respite from the teacher-centric activity, only you have to again come back to the serious work done by teachers. So it created a dualistic mind, work and play, academics and play. Now Tagore questioned that. Tagore said, almost like Illich, that learning is all perfect. Every moment is a moment of learning. It doesn't take place only when the teacher is teaching history and physics. It takes place everywhere, all the time. So I would say that when I chill, uh, when I see my children at the ashram, you know, uh, climbing the trees, working in the kitchen, sweeping the garden, you know, cleaning the garden, working with joy in the kitchen, chopping the vegetables, great learning takes place. Every moment is a moment of learning. Every moment is a moment of creativity, self-exploration, and joy. You know. And that is where I believe, you know, that in the entry point, essentially the mind that Tagore was creating, trying to create through his educational practices, not what Prime Minister Modi regarded as in his book, Exam Warrior. His book was titled as Exam Warrior. It's not Exam Warrior. That's the coaching center want you to be an exam warrior. Your anxiety ridden parent want you to be an exam warrior. You know, hyper competitive exam warrior. But pedagogues like Tagore wanted you to develop the relational self, a self that relates, a self that relates to the world around, with a sense of enchantment, with a sense of wonder, with a sense of relatedness. And it is a relational ecological self, not a hyper competitive exam warrior. That was the imagination. And see today the corruption of the imagination. That we say, exam warrior. Are our children supposed to be warriors? Exam warriors? What Gibran has written in the Prophet? That your child is not just your child. Your child is the child of the light trying to seek its self. Your child is the child of the cosmos. Is my child only a fit chi child? Is my child only a child whose destiny is only to read only those guidebooks? Is my child only destiny to be a well-fed, well-clothed slave of the techno-corporate empire? See the corruption of the imagination. And here Tagore was talking about that like Gibran. Your child is the child of the life trying to unfold itself, a relational self, an ecological self. A relational self with wonder. And likewise, Krishnamurti, as a wanderer, lifelong wanderer, again going against all institutionalized organ uh, all institutionalized organizations. Just a moment. Yeah, all institutionalized organ organizations. You know, as Krishnamurti, when he abandoned, you know what theosophical society and the way Ami Bashan wanted to nurture him and try the best that he would emerge as a world machine and create a new religion of humankind. But there was a process of inner charming evolving and he was realizing that this is not his path. And then he came out of it. And we all know he gave his famous speech, Truth is a Pathless Land. And he said that no institutionalized dogma no organized religion, no fixed system can take us to the truth. To strive for the truth is a ceaseless quest. It is a search. It is a quest. It is a process. It is the spirit of being a wanderer. It is the spirit of walking and walking and walking endlessly. It is the spirit of being a wanderer. It is not to, you know, accept the dogma of certainty. That, oh, I have found Marxism, I have found truth. I have found Gandhism, I have found truth. I have found Islam, I have found Hinduism, I have found my truth. No, it is a ceaseless wonder. It is a ceaseless reflection and questioning and the spirit. And that's why it is a pathless land. 
as he says, and this is why, as Krishnamurti would say, that see the way and he would reflect on everything. Many of you have read his extremely illuminating lyrical writings on education, his conversation with teachers, with young children, and even the children of the schools which emerged out of the inspiration of Krishnamurti. So the valley schools, the Rishi Valley schools, and the other. And we could see a lot of YouTube Krishnamurti conversation, you know, children with teacher and his speeches, the kind of questions that Krishnamurti was saying. And it root lying that he said, truth is a pathless land. So one is a wanderer, one is a seeker, one is striving. And this is why the Krishnamurti would say that see that you know that what has happened, that even I, through our prevalent form of education, have corrupted the mind. The mind is so much, so much learning, so much bombardment of information and theories have taken place. The mind has become very conditioned, very conditioned mind. And as a result, it, it, it has lost its freshness. It has lost its ability to ask new questions. It's very conditioned. The more we come to schools and colleges and universities, the more theories and those thick books and the jargons that we read, and the more we carry the burden of knowledge and scholarship, the more the mind has become conditioned, non-refreshing, non-imaginative. So uh, I'll just tell you uh, about an experiment. Once in my class, in supposedly one of the very politically articulate university in the country, Jawaharlal Nehru University, in my class, you know, long back uh, with my experimental art, I asked a group of bright sociology students coming from the lit colleges of the major metropolitan cities, Delhi, Calcutta, Bombay, and others. I asked them that, tell me, just speak five minutes about caste. But there is one condition. You cannot quote Evans Renifer, you cannot quote Louis Dumont, you cannot quote Dipankar Gupta, you cannot quote Khure, you cannot quote any book that you have read in your college and university. And imagine as if they were never born, but speak of caste. Believe me, it became so difficult for students to speak even for three minutes. Then collectively, we thought about it, we reflected on it. We thought, you know, had I given you another assignment and given you an assignment, a very plagiarized assignment, that right about Emin Srinivas's Rampura village and the way Emin Srinivas looked at the caste dynamics through his field work, I knew he could have written a perfectly academically hygienic term paper with perfect bibliography and perfect footnotes, but where you will be missing. You will be missing. There is no reflexivity on your part. There is no thinking on your part. You have crammed Rampura, but you have never seen the village from where you have come. You have never looked at your own village. You have never looked at the way the caste operates in you. Mind has become conditioned, and that is what university calls knowledge, and that is what we judge. This industry of publications, plagiarism is not something that a software would judge. Plagiarism is in the mind. It is the product of a conditioned mind, a mind which, in the language of Tagore, has become a pattern. It is absurd today if I use the word power and a sociology student mechanically remembers only two names, Max Weber and Michel Foucault. I do not feel happy about it. If I speak the word gender, mechanically they say Simon de Beauvoir and Judith Butler. I do not feel happy about it. I do not feel impressed by it. I would rather feel happy if a young learner has actually seen, felt, observed, experienced something and tried to make sense of it. And I believe that is what Krishnamurti was saying. So much burden of knowledge, so much conditioned mind. A conditioned mind has become a machine. The machine that manufactures books and publications 
and the producer's papers. The rot, that entire rot of it, the entire pollution of it, you know. And this is where, as uh, Krishnamurti says, that decondition in the mind and learning. Learning, meaningful learning, is not possible without unlearning. So, friends, we have to unlearn fifty physics. We have to unlearn, unlearn quota. We have to unlearn what coaching centers have taught us. We have to unlearn what in our classrooms, a non-dialogic, plagiarized teacher, everyday dictates. We have to unlearn the way we write in many of our journals. We have to bring freshness. We have to think and imagine. Only then, you know, the learning would become, as Ilich would say, an awareness, a celebration. Thinking would be dialogic, reflexive, critical, and we would move towards democracy, towards egalitarian society. And today, the world that you see is essentially a world filled with two. One is techno spectacles, the spectacles that you see all around, the media spectacles, techno spectacles, from surgical strike to the world to the Olympics, carnival. You know, the techno spectacle. And second is that, you know, that entire propaganda machine filled with the falsehood, filled with the falsehood and the cacophony of all sorts of noises. Our children are growing up amid this techno spectacle, the propaganda machinery, and amid this education shops, and amid this new liberal doctrine that I am nothing but a consumer insulated consumer driven by the arch to maximize my pleasure through a process of ceaseless consumption. The consumption that destroys the environment, that destroys ecology and leads to where we are today, the climate crisis, climate crisis in the world. So how we reimagine education, rethink education, you and I as students, teachers, parents, pedagogues have to think of it. My appeal to all of you with folded hands is that friends think of it, reflect on it. Something which is radical, which is innovative, which has a possibility, which questions the prevalent practice, there will be a temptation to denounce it as utopian foolishness. I would like you not to fall into that trap because the system wants you to believe that. System wants you to believe that everything else is utopian except your identity as a consumer. That is the market wants you to do. Don't fall into that trap. And modern slavery is invisible. Critical pedagogy would make us see modern slavery. That how it appears through a seductive logic of success, of consumerism. You know, and this is where I urge you to see it and to transform, try our best to transform today's utopias into feasible utopias, into small, small experiments and practices. No matter where you and I are looking, no matter what the scale is all about, in our classrooms, in our families, in our engagement with our children, in our local libraries, in our book club, in our small library that you and I can create in the neighborhood. You know, all that, these are the exponents. Revolution is not something spectacular that happens one fine morning and Arnold Goswami gives a light commentary on it on television channels. Revolution is happening only through these experiments, small, small, everyday experiments in our classrooms, in the way we write, in the way we think, in the way we practice academics as parents, as teachers, as students, as seekers, as wanderers, from the small book club that even I can initiate in our neighborhood, from a discussion forum that we can organize in our home, from a small workshop with the children, you know, or the way we teach, the way we engage with young learners. And don't undermine the importance of small efforts. Remember, Schumacher wrote a beautiful book, Small is Beautiful. We are so carried away 
by all that is being spectacular, that we tend to think that even revolution has to be very big, gigantic, spectacular. Never happened. It never happens in that life. When your wife came from office, you know, came back from your office, and you have come on here, you just rush to the kitchen. You do not make any scene. You make two cups of coffee, beautiful coffee, and your wife has just come from the washroom after being fresh, and you share those coffee. And she is tired. Without saying anything, you just go to the kitchen. You cook. Maybe a simple khichuri, simple roti and dal. A revolution takes place in the kitchen. A revolution takes place in the kitchen. And that small thing has its significance. That small thing has its importance. Patriarchy won't change only by writing an essay on Judith Butler and so on. Thank you very much for listening to me and for bearing this utopian dream. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lord. बिल्कुल सर आपने आज के विषय के हवाले से बड़ी ही आपने मैं आपके लेक्चर को सुन रहा था एज ए टीचर बड़ा मुतासर था मैं आप कुछ नहीं बोलना बोलना चाहूँगा क्योंकि आपने आज के विषय के संदर्भ में इतने अच्छे ढंग से इतने तर्कमय ढंग से हमारे श्रोताओं के साथ अपने विचार साझे किए खासतौर पर आज की जो शिक्षा प्रणाली है उसके बारे में उसके क्या प्रॉब्लम्स हैं किस तरह के शिक्षा का मॉडल चल रहा है उसको बदलने के लिए आपने उसके पैरल एक मॉडल उसारने के लिए आपने जो बातें की आ, मैं आशा करता हूं कि हमारे श्रोताओं ने इस लेक्चर से काफ़ी लाहा उठाया होगा और आ, मैं बेनती भी करूंगा हमारे श्रोताओं के इस लेक्चर को हमारे आ, अपने विद्यार्थियों के साथ अपने टीचर्स के साथ जरूर साझा कीजिए ताकि एक जो शिक्षा का मॉडल है जिसकी बात प्रोफेसर अभिजीत पाठक जी ने की है वो ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा लोगों तक जाए प्रोफेसर साहब हमारे श्रोता ने कुछ सवाल साझे किए हमारे साथ मैं आपके साथ साझा करना चाहूंगा पहला सवाल हमें प्रोफेसर सुखदेव सोल जी कर रहे हैं Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I, 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 I read that question. Should I reply to it? G, G, बिल्कुल sir. Okay, okay, okay. Now, thank you for asking these wonderful questions and the very insightful questions. And uh, I think that uh, 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 I agree with uh, uh, what you were saying and uh, what you were thinking. Uh, and i think that uh, you know, the instrumental reason and the instrumental logic uh, uh, which today uh, the uh, uh, techno um, corporate empire you know and the new liberal market the way uh, it has reduced rationality into uh, a instrumental logic of domination and the instrumental logic of profit that is indeed something to be worried about and uh, imagine for example when immanuel kant was writing that famous essay what is enlightenment you know yeah, and then immanuel kant's notion of the enlightenment that human kind coming out of self incurred minority status that means the human kind would be able to see the world with the clarity of vision with reason see beyond dogmas superstitions fixed thinking you know begin to look at the world with one's own eyes and the public views of reason now you see that what happened to that project of enlightenment which kant was visualizing in that celebrated essay and you could see that slowly and slowly the age of modernity we could see that the grand enlightenment dream of that liberating reason you know liberating the rationality that degenerated into a technical instrumental consciousness of domination and the control and that was what in the 20th century mid 20th century some of the finest minds the critical theorists say like eric from harbert marcuse uh, uh, theodor adorno they were 
pointing, refilling it very sharply when they were talking about this entire dialectic of the Enlightenment. And the way, as Marcuse would say, the technology itself today seems to have become domination. And there is a principle of instrumentality and the instrumental logic and domination. So these today and the neoliberal market today has further intensified it. That's why through the eyes of the neoliberalism, education is primarily a skill learning, learning technical skills. Education for them is a value neutral technical skill. Education is not political. Education is not sociological. Education is not critical, philosophical. It is the mastery of certain kind of skill that you need to develop in order to find yourself as a robotic performer in the workplace. And this is where you could see that when that becomes primary importance, as Habermas said beautifully, colonization of the life world by the system, then what happens? The hermeneutic understanding, emancipatory understanding. You know, say for example, when you study people like Sigmund Freud, psychoanalysis, or Karl Marx, these are not instrumental. Freud is asking us, is teaching us how we understand the huge domain of the unconscious that is causing some kind of trouble in my conflict with personality and how I make sense of it and become the master of my work. Or Marx was teaching me how I see the principles of domination and ideology, overcome it and seek to strive for a better world and the just world. So these are very hermeneutic, emancipatory branches of knowledge. But how the instrumental education seems to undermine its importance. That's why you are right. You have asked this question that you could see growing devaluation of liberal arts, humanities, reflexive critical sciences, and I would say even foundational sciences, physics, mathematics, chemistry as foundational sciences. You go to any of this education shop, private institute, you see the courses like fashion designing, hotel management, information technology, business management. But seldom do you see a course, say, for example, on aesthetics, on literature, on social science, or even theoretical physics, or the theoretical mathematics. That, I think, is the irony of our times. And you are absolutely right in pointing out. जी सर अगला सवाल सनु प्रोफेसर स्वराज राज जी कर रहे हैं जी या या इधर नो दिस इज़ द क्वेश्चन आई सी हाउ टू प्रमोट इट आई डू नॉट नो हाउ आई आंसर टू द क्वेश्चन हाउ बट आई टेंड टू फील दैट एनी काइंड ऑफ possibility of doing something emerges when you and I are willing to acknowledge the crisis, acknowledge the problem. Sometimes what happens that we are so saturated with the system or the system has brainwashed so much that we refuse to acknowledge the problem. Today, many of us in our households, in our family, refuse to acknowledge that there is a problem with this process of growing up. That the way our children are growing up with coaching centers, with this sort of social Darwinism, hyper competitiveness, with this sort of one dimensional education. We seem to be, many of us seem to be quite comfortable with this. But the moment we acknowledge, you no, know, it is sickness. You know, it's like saying that the moment I acknowledge that certain kind of food is not causing is causing problem to my health, to my dietary system, to my living pattern. The moment I acknowledge, it, only then I evolve an alternative dietary practice. But quite often we refuse to acknowledge it. So I think the first thing which I was trying to argue forcefully that for God's sake acknowledge the crisis. It is a crisis today. And the all perfecting presence of education shops, coaching centers, guidebooks do not want us to acknowledge it. We normalize it. So, normal, so problematize what appears to be normal. 
you know, and when we problematize it, only then you and I would be able to arrive at a solution. But as at the end I say, that solution is also not something mythical solution. That solution is not something also spectacular, magical solution. That solution can happen through your and my everyday practices. In our everyday side, everyday sphere. That's why as I'm saying, making a good book club, you know, making something innovative. I know, for example, about a small, innovative, beautiful project during the lockdown time when large this and that online teaching, particularly for school children, is a myth, except some children of the privileged schools from the metropolitan cities and towns. You know, no meaningful learning is taking place. Now, I know a group, Shiksha Sharaj. Now, what's with the rural children of Bihar? Now, the way, for example, if you go to the household of the parents, engage with the children, approach them with sufficient precaution, work with them, teach differently, language, literature, maths. This is quite a lamb. It is a small lamb. It's a possibility. It is not something that would alter the world in it, change the world worldly. If in your own classroom, you know, you innovate, you create, and you make some difference in the thinking of some young learners, overnight it won't change the world, but it would create the ground, it would begin the ground, you know, and that is where I think you and I have to start, no matter where you and I are situated and located. Yes, sir, uh, Haji, sir, uh, ਇਨਾ ਵਧੀਆ ਲੈਕਚਰ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਂਝਾ ਕਰਨ ਲਈ ਖਾਸ ਤੌਰ ਤੇ ਐਜੂਕੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਸਵਾਲ ਹੈਗੇ ਨੇ ਐਜੂਕੇਸ਼ਨ ਕੇ ਜਿਸ ਸਵਾਲੋਂ ਸੇ ਹਮ ਖਾਤਬ ਹੋ ਰਹੇ ਹਨ ਜੋ ਹਮੇ ਫੇਸ ਕਰਨੇ ਪੜ ਰਹੇ ਹਨ ਉਸਕੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਮੇ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਹਮ ਕਾਲਜ ਮੇ ਔਰ ਸਾਥ ਜਬ ਵੀ ਹਮ ਦੋਸਤ ਇਕੱਠੇ ਹੋਤੇ ਹਨ ਟੀਚਰਸ ਇਕੱਠੇ ਹੋਤੇ ਹਨ ਇਨ ਸਵਾਲੋਂ ਕੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਮੇ ਚਰਚਾ ਹੋਤੀ ਹੈ ਆਪ ਨੇ ਆਜ ਉਨ ਸਵਾਲੋਂ ਕੇ ਜੋ ਥਾਰੋਲੀ ਇੱਕ ਰੇਂਜ ਬਣਤੀ ਹੈ ਉਸਕੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਮੇ ਆਪ ਨੇ ਬੜੀ ਖੂਬਸੂਰਤ ਤਰੀਕੇ ਸੇ ਹਮਾਰੇ ਸਾਥ ਬਾਤ ਸਾਂਝੀ ਕੀ ਹਮੇ ਇਨ ਸਵਾਲੋਂ ਕੇ ਕਾਫੀ ਹੱਦ ਤੱਕ ਜਵਾਬ ਵੀ ਮਿਲੇ ਹੈ ਪ੍ਰੈਜੈਂਟ ਸਿਨੈਰੀਓ ਮੇ ਜੋ ਐਜੂਕੇਸ਼ਨ ਕਾ ਮਾਡਲ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਕਿਸ ਸਾਈਡ ਜਾ ਰਹਾ ਹੈ ਉਸੇ ਕਿਸ ਸਾਈਡ ਜਾਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਏ ਇਸਕੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਮੇ ਆਪ ਨੇ ਬੜੀ ਖੂਬਸੂਰਤ ਤਰੀਕੇ ਸੇ ਬਾਤ ਸਾਂਝੀ ਕੀ ਆਪਕੇ ਜੋ ਆਰਟੀਕਲ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਹਮ ਅਕਸਰ ਅਖਬਾਰ ਮੇ ਪੜ੍ਹਤੇ ਰਹਤੇ ਹੈ उससे भी हमें एक नई सेहत मिलती है आज के समय में किस तरह की एजुकेशन होनी चाहिए खास तौर पे जो बच्चे हैं जो डेमोक्रेटिक सेटअप में बच्चों का जो एक इनसाइट है बच्चों को जो सीखने की प्रक्रिया वो कैसी होनी चाहिए इसके बारे में आपके लेक्चर के माध्यम से और आपके आर्टिकल के माध्यम से हमारे टीचर्स और रिसर्चर्स आप पढ़ते रहते हैं तो आज के लेक्चर के लिए मैं एक टीचर होने के नाते आपसे बहुत متاثر ہوں بہت پربابت ہوں اور پریرت بھی ہوں کہ آپ نے اتنی اچھی شکشہ کے بارے میں جو آپ نے بچار رکھی ہیں وہ ہمارے جو ہمارے دوست ہیں ہمارے ٹیچر ساتھی ہیں وہ آپ کے اس لیکچر سے کافی کچھ سیکھیں گے آپ کا ہماری کالج مینجمنٹ کی طرف سے پرنسپل ڈاکٹر پوجندر سنگھ براڑ جی کی طرف سے سمو سٹاف کی طرف سے بچوں کی طرف سے اور خاص طور پر میری طرف سے آپ کا بہت بہت دھنے بات کہ آپ ہمارے اس منج پہ آئے और इतने खूबसूरत विचार इतने तर्कमय विचार आज की एजुकेशन के मॉडल पे खास तौर पे जिस समय एक टेक्नो साम्राज्य सेदत जड़ी एजुकेशन चल रही है उसके बारे में आपने सांझे किए आपका बहुत-बहुत शुक्रिया सर प्रोफेसर अजीत पाठक जी आपका बहुत-बहुत शुक्रिया आपका धन्यवाद आप इस मंच पे आए और हमारे साथ इतनी जड़े विचार है तर्कमय विचार आपने सांझे किए जी अभिजय अजीत पाठक प्रोफेसर अजीत पाठक जी आप कुछ कहना चाहेंगे Ha, thank you lakbir mane thank you uh, for this nice evening and making it possible and giving me an opportunity to come to this wonderful forum and i tried my best to share some of my ideas with you and as i have said that i'm not a bookish person uh, i speak from my heart and as ibal uh, alama ibal wrote a very beautiful poem about the conversation between brain and heart Uh, and i seek to engage in a conversation between brain and heart unlike many academics i do not erect a wall between heart and brain and uh, that's why uh, uh, all that i have spoken uh, uh, 
it speaks from the authenticity of my being. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to come. Here I'll be. यूर आलविज बिल्कुल सर हम चाहेंगे कि जब भी आपको यहाँ पंजाब में आपको बुलाएंगे जब हालात ठीक हुए तो आपको एक लाइव सुनने का मौका मिलेगा प्रोग्राम किसी सेमिनार में आपको बुलाएंगे तभी इस तरह के फेस टू फेस सुनने का मौका मिलेगा आपका बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद सर फिर से आपका हमारे साथ जुड़े और इतना अच्छा लेक्चर हमारे साथ साझा किया बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया सारे स्रोत्या का भी बहुत बहुत धनबाद जो सा जुड़े रहे हैं जहाँ ने सवाल के जरिए अपना जो संवाद में इस डायलॉग को अगर तुरंत हिस्सा पाया सो दोस्तों इस तरह आप अगले एतवार किसी होर महत्वपूर्ण टॉपिक में लैके तो सामू घूमेंगे तद तक भी सार्व नमस्कार सत श्रीकाल